Thank you all for joining us today. I'm delighted to be back with you. This is the fifth in our series. And next week, we're going to do coding for eye conditions and OBGYN. But today, we're going to talk about primary care. Now, if you've been listening in on some of these, either in person or recorded, you know that we've already talked about chronic care, trauma, digestive conditions, and cardiac conditions. So even though in primary care, that takes up a lot of what you do, we're not going to repeat that today. Today, I'm going to talk fairly briefly about signs and symptoms, because that's going to be so easy for all of us. I don't need to spend a lot of time on it examination codes, also fairly briefly, and mental health. And you know what I say, ICD-10 is going to be easy for us as long as we don't deliver babies or take care of any injuries. Those are the two chapters that I think are going to pose the most challenges for us. Signs and symptoms are going to be no trouble for us whatsoever. Those are codes in the R00 to R99 category. And really, we're not going to have trouble with those codes. I'm just going to spend a little time on them. If you've been listening in, you've seen this slide before. And if you're an expert crack ICD-9 coder, you know these tenets to be true. That on the physician side, we don't code probable, suspectable, suspected, rule out, or working diagnosis. If we don't have a defined definitive diagnosis that the physician, nurse practitioner, or physician's assistant has given us, then we code the sign or the symptom. And if we know the diagnosis, we don't code the sign or the symptom. So recently I did some chart audits, and um, uh, foot pain was listed as one of the diagnoses on the claim form. But when you looked in the record, the patient had gout. And in that same series of uh, urgent care center notes, I saw ankle or foot pain again, but the patient had an ankle fracture. When we have a known diagnosis, we use it. If, and if we have a diagnosis, we don't add the pain. So if we know the patient has osteoarthritis, then we don't code for the pain. So this is no different than ICD-10 or than ICD-9, and you're going to have no trouble with it. Many of these are one-to-one -one matches. So remember, we're going from 14,000 ICD-9 codes, and frankly, I thought that was plenty. But now we're going to 70,000 ICD-10 codes, and it's very overwhelming to even think about that. But a lot of those changes are in the trauma chapter. That's why I say let's not treat any more injuries, send them off to urgent care. But the trauma chapter gets very big in terms of laterality and specificity. So in signs and symptoms, most of these, we're not going to have any trouble in the index or whether we're using an electronic program. So here are just a few examples. We have symptoms, cough, nausea, chills, fever. We have abnormal diagnostic tests, either on imaging or on uh, laboratory tests. So many of them, as I said, have a one-to-one -one match between ICD-9 and ICD-10. Just like in our current coding system, some conditions are found in the signs and symptoms chapter, in the R chapter, and some are found in the, in the organ system chapter that they belong with. Insomnia, we did have a code in ICD-9 for insomnia, unspecified. That now is moved to the nervous system. G47.00, insomnia, unspecified. And if I look at this G47 group, I see I have codes for um, hypersomnia, circadian rhythm sleep disorders, narcolepsy, periodic limb movement, and of course the one that we see frequently, obstructive sleep apnea. You've seen this slide before if you've been tuning in. Uh, chest pain gets a little more specific in ICD-10. And here's an example if you look at 786.52, painful respiration. That crosses exactly to R07.1. Simply, it has a change in description. And about 25% of ICD-9 codes will cross exactly to ICD-10, but most of those have this 
bit of a change in the description that we see here. So we have a few more codes here in this section, but not that many. Headache works exactly the same as ICD-9 as in ICD-10. If we have a headache for a patient who comes in with just a sign or a symptom and we don't know the type of headache, we use the equivalent of that, um, I think it was 784.0 code, headache. But if we know the type of headache, we go into the nervous system chapter. So that's really all I'm going to say today about signs and symptoms because they work just like in ICD-10, ICD-9. See, I'm already thinking about ICD-10. Um, the index is going to be easy to find them, and the rules have remained the same. What I'm going to spend most of the time on today is mental health. And of course, sometimes people who don't work in health care don't understand that most of the care of patients who have mental health disorders takes place in the primary care office. Good luck trying to find a psychiatrist to see that Medicaid patient or even that patient who has really good insurance. They're so booked up. It's just hard to get patients seen. So we in primary care end up doing the treatment. So that's what I'm going to spend most of this hour on. And I've started with the blocks. And at the start of every chapter in ICD-10, there are these blocks. I think of them as the table of contents. And it just shows us how they've organized uh, the chapter. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to read those to you. You can look at them. By the way, if you have not bought an ICD-10 book, now is the time to do that. And then as your, um, even if you have online access and a coding program, if you have a coder in your office, buy an ICD-10 book because some things are just easier to look up in the book. When you have pages and pages to scroll through, for that category of code, because it's gotten so big, the book is easier to look in than online. And I, I use both. One thing I'm going to say now is a lot of times, 10 years ago, when I was talking to practices, they would say to me, we're not allowed to use the mental health codes. We get denials. And the reason they got denials is because the payer would say, you're not part of our behavioral health network, so we can't pay you to treat depression or anxiety. And so we would flip the codes and put hypertension in the first position and depression in the second position, and then the payer was happier. I don't hear that so much anymore. When I talk to people in primary care, they say that the payers do pay for codes from the mental health chapter uh, in the first position. And what I say is, we're going to code it as we do it. We're coding match the, the documentation in the record. OK, so let me start with dementia. We have vascular dementia. And if we had a book in front of us, it would say, code first the underlying physiological condition. So they're saying to you, don't use F01 category code first. Code first the underlying physiological condition. And F02, dementia in, in, other, in diseases that are classified elsewhere, it tells us code first the underlying condition. And if I look at F02 in the code book, there are a list of about 21 conditions, including Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. So that means if you have a patient who has dementia and it's caused by Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or one of those other 20 conditions, you would code that first. So what does that look like? Patient with Parkinson's disease presents with a spouse who describes confusion, memory problems, combativeness, wandering, and inability to be left alone. So if we went to dementia, it would say to us, code the underlying condition. And that's what we would do. We would code first the Parkinson's, and then we would code the dementia in other diseases classified elsewhere with behavioral disturbance, because the spouse reported combativeness and inability to be left alone. If we have a code that is with, you can be sure there's a code for without. So if it was a patient without behavioral disturbance, we would have a code for that. You know, There's a code for that, just like there's an app for that. With 70,000 codes, there's a code for that. And then we have a notation, use an additional code, if applicable, to identify wandering. And there's a code for wandering 
quote, in diseases classified elsewhere. So that's dementia coding. When we get to substance abuse, ICD-10 codes are classified by what the substance is that we're abusing and whether we are use, whether the use of that substance is use, dependence, or abuse. And let me say, these are clinical terms. So I, as a coder, don't read the note and say, wow, this person, she's gone over right from, a, from use to abuse. I can see that in the note. We count on our clinicians to do that. And specific coding depends on it. Now, honest and true, there are unspecified codes, and I'm going to show you some examples of those. If you're, if you're in a Medicare ACO, if you're doing shared savings plans with anybody, or risk-adjusted contracts, we want to try not to use the unspecified codes, particularly for substance abuse, because it's such a high-risk area. So there's a hierarchy. And where does this hierarchy come from? It comes from the front of the ICD-10 book and the general guidelines. If both use and abuse are documented, assign only abuse, because use is less serious than abuse. If abuse and dependence are documented, assign the code for dependence. So there's our hierarchy. It goes use is bad, abuse is worse, dependence is the worst, if we're going to do you know, bad, worse, and worse. For use, abuse, and dependence, we assign only dependence. And if use and dependence are assigned, we assign only dependence. So basically, the more serious the patient's condition in terms of the use of that substance is the one that we document, and it's, it's the one that we assign. And we don't assign the others. So we don't assign both uh, a code from use, abuse, and a dependence. So first, we identify the substance, and then how they're using the type of disorder. When we look in ICD-10 under a use, we have a code for uncomplicated. And this is just like ICD-9 in so many ways, except it's run amok in ICD-10. So we always had codes in ICD-9 for with and without complications. But now we have many more codes for with a complication or without. And here in the substance abuse codes, they say uncomplicated. So we, we first we say, what what the substance is, and then if they use it, is it uncomplicated, or is it complicated by one of those lists of complications on the bottom of the screen, which I won't read to you. If the patient has abuse of the substance, it's either uncomplicated or a number of complications. And different substances have different uh, series of complications that could be used. And if the patient is in dependence, we have either uncomplicated, now here's something new, in remission, and of course that's not completely new from ICD-10, but as we're breaking, from ICD-9, but as we're breaking this out from use, abuse, and dependence, only dependence gets in remission. So we can't have in remission from use or abuse, it's in remission from dependence. So we have, we've identified the substance, we've identified the type of use of the substance, and if it's dependence, then is it uncomplicated or in remission? Or does it have certain complications? So let's look at some examples. Uh, F10.18, alcohol abuse with alcohol-induced anxiety disorder. Here's the one in the middle we're going to talk about again, F10.21, alcohol dependence in remission. There's no more personal history of alcohol dependence. Now, that's in the mental health chapter, alcohol dependence in remission, or alcohol dependence with withdrawal uncomplicated. Some of us might say, well, if they're in withdrawal, how can it be uncomplicated? But I'm just a coder, so I'm going to code what the clinician says to me. And there's a note that says, for alcohol-related disorders, use additional code for blood alcohol level if applicable. Now, even if the patient comes into your office smelling of alcohol, we're probably not going to do a test to measure the blood alcohol level. So that notation is going to be relevant where? In the emergency department or for inpatient admissions. So how's this? Could we code this? Brought to the ER by police, obviously intoxicated, Past medical history indicates that this is a chronic problem. 
So we're going to go beyond use probably if it's a chronic problem. But again, I'm not doing that unless the clinician tells me that. But I need the clinician to tell me if this patient has abuse or dependence. And the codes there, alcohol dependence with intoxication, uncomplicated, alcohol dependence with intoxication, delirium, there are a number of different choices that we would have for this alcohol dependence. And if the patient was in the hospital, um, then we would add the Y90 code um, for uh, the blood alcohol level. Now, there are still unspecified codes sprinkled, littered through the substance abuse section. So here are a few of them. If we have our choice, we don't want to use an unspecified code. It probably will get the claim paid. It doesn't have a risk-adjusted factor. It doesn't tell the payer how sick the patient is. And particularly when we get to opioid dependence, when you're treating patients with suboxone, then I think we want to communicate to the payer the severity of the patient and whether the patient, whether it's continuous or in remission. So we're going to um, look at more specific codes there. So alcohol use in ICD-10, use, abuse, or dependence, clinical definitions, expanded from ICD-9. And in ICD-9, we had this V code for personal history of um, uh, um, alcoholism, but now in ICD-10 we're going to use a code right from the mental health chapter, F10.21, alcohol dependence in remission. It's not a personal history of anymore. That's one of the biggest changes that we see. Here is a list of substances. Nicotine dependence is in here, so the equivalent of 305.1 is going to be an F17 code. Um, and these are the, the way they've defined them. And then here are just some examples. So here's cannabis abuse with intoxication, um, cannabis dependence with intoxication, or we have an unspecified code. So there's always a, a unspecified code. Uh, I mean, there's always a code for uncomplicated in both use, abuse, and dependence. So we're, we're able to use those. And again, there are plenty of unspecified codes that we're going to try not to use. So here's a patient who presents with long-term opioid dependence and chronic pain. Patient comes to the therapy session or to your office with psychotic delusions with no hallucinations being treated by a pain specialist. So in this case, we have a really specific code, F11.250, opioid dependence with opioid psychotic disorder with um, delusions and we would assign that specific a code. If the chronic pain was also addressed, we have a code from the nervous system section, just like we do in ICD-9, a code from the 338 series, G89.4. So when we have a personal history of drug dependence, we go to the index, if we're using an index, and it's dependence, drug, by type, and then it's in remission. So if this patient was in remission for opioid dependence, we would have a code for that. Let me just briefly um, talk about the book versus online or in your systems. Personally, I find the index in ICD-10 daunting. It's big. It's huge. It's bigger than the index in ICD-9. Now, if you're good at um, ICD-9 index, you're probably going to be OK in the ICD-10 index. But I'm going to say I probably was never that good. So I often use an online search tool. I use icd10data.com. I use that as my index. And then I want to see the full uh, code choices for that category. And sometimes I look at it online, but often I switch over to, um, to my book. If you're treating patients for opioid dependence, then you want to use a specific code for that. And you want to, they're going to be dependent. You're going to use opioid dependence and then uncomplicated or with specific complications or in remission if they're in remission. So here's some in remission examples opioid dependence in remission, 
cannabis dependence in remission. They're all, um, we have one for every type of substance. Most of us don't have this level of detail currently in our records. And I would encourage you as we make this transition from ICD-9, particularly if this is the first diagnosis on the claim form. So if you're putting, you know, if you're really treating the hypertension and chronic kidney disease and diabetes and the patient also has alcohol um, abuse or use, then the specificity of it isn't as important to me as if we're um, treating the opioid dependence that's why the patient came in for monitoring that and to have the suboxone refill. Use a very specific diagnosis code for that. All right, let's move on from substance abuse and talk about some other mental health conditions. Uh, F20 to F29 and F30. So F20 to F29 are schizophrenia. They're defined by the type of disorder, including a brief psychotic disorder and delusional disorder. Those codes are not going to present much of a problem for us. One new code in ICD-10 is manic episode. So if you have a patient who has a single manic episode but has not been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, we have a code for that, F30. Notice it has an excludes one note. It excludes one, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, major depressive disorder, single episode or recurrent. What this is for F30 is a manic episode with or without psychotic symptoms, and it can be mild, moderate, severe, partial, or full remission. So F30 is the category. There are going to be many, many more codes beneath it. In ICD-9, we have a single excludes codes. So we have the condition. It'll list what's included and then it lists what's excluded. In ICD-10, we have two excludes notes. Excludes one, which means that's not your code, it's not coded here, and excludes two means this isn't the code you're looking for, but if the patient has both conditions, you can code both. But what they're saying to you here is, if the patient has bipolar disorder, we're not going to code the manic episode. We're going to code the more specific bipolar disorder code. And here are our three major um, depressive disorders, bipolar, major depressive disorder, single episode, or we could say first, and major depressive disorder, recurrent. Depression is defined in ICD-10 as singular recurrent, and then by severity, mild, moderate, severe, with or without psychotic features, then remission, is it partial or full remission, and then we have this recurrence. We want to avoid, if we can, particularly if we're treating it, the equivalent of 311 for major depression. That crosses to a very unspecified code. And again, if you're part of an ACO or have any risk-adjusted contracts, avoid 311. There are more specific codes for a patient who has major depressive disorder. So here are some bipolar disorder episodes. Uh, codes, and there, there's an um, unspecified mood disorder code that everyone uses in the 296 series. Again, I want us to avoid those. So F31.11, bipolar disorder, current episode manic, without psychotic features, mild. So we know if we have mild, we're going to have moderate, severe, severe with or without psychotic features. F31.11, 1.31, bipolar disorder, current episode, depressed, mild. We'll have the others. And then F31.61, bipolar disorder, current episode, mixed, mild. And again, we know we're going to have the other uh, severities listed or in full remission or in partial remission. These are all clinical terms, and we're going to count on our clinician to make the diagnosis and we coders are just going to help code it. Depressive Depression examples for major depression, we have single episode or recurrent episode, mild, moderate. We have these unspecified codes, again, S32.9, major depressive disorder, single episode unspecified, or recurrent unspecified. 
we're going to try to be specific whenever we can. So let's see if we can code this case. We have a therapist documenting and evaluating a 32-year-old patient with a long history of depression, PTSD. No history of manic episodes, so we know the patient doesn't have bipolar disorder. One prior suicide attempt. And our diagnosis is a major depressive disorder of moderate severity without current suicidal ideation and no psychosis. So what did we have documented? Major depressive disorder, no features of bipolar, it's recurrent, we have the severity, the patient also has PTSD, we had a suicide attempt in the past, and no psychotic features. So a lot of those conditions, a lot of those descriptors that we see on the screen here are going to go into one code. And then we're going to have a code for PTSD and personal history of self-harm. But everything else you see on this screen is going to go into our depression code. And here it is, F33.2, major depressive disorder, recurrent, severe, without psychotic features. And then we have an additional code for PTSD, chronic. You know, if we have one for chronic, we're going to have one for acute. And personal history of self-harm, the Z91.5, which is an equivalent to a V code that we have now. So you ask yourself, would your current depression documentation be specific enough? And I know if there are clinicians on the line, you're saying, does it matter? So this example was for a therapist. Does the primary care clinician have to be this specific? And what I'm, what I'm going to say about that is, if depression is the first code on your claim form, then you want to try to be specific about it. If depression is only the eighth code on your claim form, if we can get eight codes on the claim form, and you're renewing a long-standing prescription, maybe it doesn't matter so much if it is that specific, unless you're in an ACO or have risk-based contracts. And in that case, we're going to try to get as specific a code as possible. How about anxiety? We don't have to be worried about anxiety. It doesn't have to cause us any problems. Uh, it's fairly similar to ICD-9. You see one change on the bottom of this slide. PTSD unspecified, acute, or chronic. And like in ICD-9, we have an instruction that says, if there's a code for an acute on chronic condition, we select only that one code. And heart failure is an example of that. If the patient has um, acute on, excuse me, acute on chronic diastolic heart failure, there's one code. But if there's no code for acute on chronic, like here for PTSD, and the patient has chronic PTSD and an acute exacerbation, we code both conditions according to ICD-10, and we put the acute code first. So that's a guideline from the front of the ICD-10 book. Attention deficit disorders, predominantly inattentive, predominantly hyper, hyperactive, combined, or unspecified. So if we know, we're going to choose one of the top three codes on that slide. Not a lot of change in uh, ADHD. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk about personal and family history of codes, or as the book likes to call it, factors influencing health status, contact with health services. These are the old V codes, which are now Z codes in ICD-10. And it includes personal and family history of mental health disorders, malignant neoplasms, or need for an exam. There's a code for noncompliance with Medicaid. And for us, what we're going to talk about right this minute are personal and family history of mental health disorders. And at the end of this session, we're going to talk about the examination codes. But there are many more things in this chapter um, that are you know, roughly equivalent to what we find in ICD-9. So family history of alcohol abuse um, or substance abuse are listed here. Family history of other mental and behavioral disorders. Personal history of problems related to upbringing, um, abuse, or neglect for a child are in this in this series of codes in the Z62 
812, or adult history, personal history of adult physical and sexual abuse or neglect are in this series as well. And all of these codes have an excludes one note, which you're going to see um, in just a minute. We're going to talk about those. So if, if the patient has current adult physical abuse, current adult sexual abuse, or if we go back to the previous slide, current child sexual abuse, then we don't code a personal history out. We code the current code. And here's an example of that in Z62.811, personal history of physical and sexual abuse in childhood. It excludes one, current child physical abuse or current child sexual abuse. And whenever we see that excludes codes, it tells you exactly where the, that other code is. Or if it said code first, it told us what the code for Parkinson's disease was in that early dementia example that we had so that we can go back and find that code. But what this means is we cannot code these conditions together. And if the patient has current child sexual abuse, we select a code in the T74 series or T76 series rather than personal history of. They're saying to you it's not the code. Whereas if there was an excludes two notes, we can, we can code both. It just means this isn't your condition. So this is one of the key changes between ICD-9 and ICD-10 is that we go from an excludes one, just an excludes notation to an excludes one and an excludes two notes. So now, um, although at the beginning of the chap at the beginning of the presentation today, I advocated against treating injuries or uh, doing high risk OB because it was going to slow us down in the coding. Um, the adult and child abuse codes are in the injury, trauma, and adverse effects chapter. The, we're going to use these codes for suspected or a confirmed adult or child abuse. If it's a history of, then we go back to those Z codes that um, we saw before. And there are specific codes for um, confirmed and abused and uh, suspected. Now these codes, because they're in the trauma chapter, need an A, a D, or an S in the seventh character. So if you, if you do treat injuries and you tuned in for the chapter on trauma, or as I like to call it, injuries are going to hurt, you saw that we needed a seventh character extender on all injuries. And if we were doing um, fracture care, we didn't just need the A, the D, or the S. There was a, many more choices for the seventh character extender. But for what we're talking about now, um, we would use A, initial encounter, used when patient is receiving active treatment for the condition, D, subsequent encounter, used after active treatment, and this works a lot better if I'm talking about a fracture, doesn't it, and the patient comes in for a cast change, it's obvious that we should be moving to a D. When do we move from an A to a D or an S in mental health disorders is not defined in the ICD-10 general guidelines. So I have a colleague who actually um, has worked on the, on the WHO committee for um, ICD-10, and I asked her what to do here, and she said, essentially use A for the first time and um, D after that, just because it doesn't fit the model that perfectly. So here, um, T74, adult and child abuse, neglect, or other maltreatment confirmed. So we're going to use these codes when we have confirmed adult abuse, abandonment, neglect, sexual abuse, or psychological abuse. So there's going to, T74 is the category. There are going to be many more codes underneath that category that are more specific and define those items listed in the first um, uh, bullet there. <clears throat> 
these are going to require a placeholder code, and I'll show you that in the sixth position, because they're five character codes. And why are they going to require a placeholder X code, which has no meaning? You know, I, we used to say X marks the spot. Now we say X holds the place. We're going to need a, an X in the sixth position, because I need a seventh character extender, an A, a D, or an S in order to um, uh, communicate whether it was the initial encounter, the subsequent encounter, or long-term after effect. We also, if we were in the book, say see the notation, use an additional code, if applicable, to identify any associated current injury. So if the patient had a fracture or a bruise, I hate to even say anything worse than that, but if the patient had, had a traumatic injury, we would use an additional code. And then there are codes to identify the perpetrator, if known, in the Y07 category. So if you know that it was the adoptive mother or the paternal mother or the sister-in-law, whoever, there are, um, there are codes. Or if it is a person who is unknown to the patient, there is a Y code that you can use. Now, it says if known. So if we don't know, what are we going to do? We're just not going to do it. And if the patient has no additional current injury, then we're not going to use an additional code. So here are the codes for confirmed. And here are the code, here's the category of code, not all of them, for suspected. So T76, adult and child abuse, neglect, or other maltreatment suspected. Uh, it will find a number of codes in the T76 category. And this also tells us use an additional code, if applicable, to identify any associated current injury. So if there's a fracture um, or a, a bruise, a contusion, we would add that code as well. And if you tuned in to the injuries are going to hurt, you know those are very specific codes in terms of location. And those injury codes also get the seventh character extender. When it says use an additional code, that's telling you use the T76 or the T74 code first and use the injury second. Now, if I'm in orthopedics, and there probably aren't any orthopedics on this call today for primary care, but if I'm in orthopedics, I'm probably going to use the fracture care code first and this other code second, even though ICD-10 tells me something differently, because ICD-10 is a coding system for diseases. It isn't about reimbursement. And sometimes we've got to mm, use our judgment about that. So here are some examples from child physical abuse confirmed. There's only five characters. It's T74.12. And we know we need the seventh character extender. Oh, and I apologize. I've got an error on the bottom of this slide, which we'll fix before we send them out. T74.12XS, child physical abuse confirmed sequela. So A for the initial encounter, D for confirmed, X for the long-term after effect. So we would have to put a seventh character on there. All right, that's mental health disorders. In, and I've tried to select the mental health disorders we see most frequently in primary care. But there are um, obviously more than that. But as long as we're specific in the documentation, I don't think we'll have a lot of problems with them. I think the problems we're going to find in coding for mental health disorders in ICD-10 is that often we don't have a specific code. And particularly, and we've talked in this series about workflow, if you're operating from a paper encounter form now, then writing depression on the encounter form is not going to allow the coder to select a specific code. And if you have a paper encounter form that has the most frequent diagnosis codes, there are too many diagnosis codes to, that you use every single day in primary care. Because you don't just code from one chapter. You code from almost every chapter in um, primary care. It's not going to work very well. So even if you're on a paper record, you're not in an EMR, I think you're going to want to use um, an electronic program, ICD10data.com, or something to help you find um, your ICD-10 codes.
Okay, examination coding. So examination coding gets a makeover in ICD-10. I thought it was working pretty well on its own, but we're gonna we're gonna have some differences. Oh, excuse me. So in um, ICD-10, excuse me, in ICD-9, we have this routine general medical examination, the routine gynecological examination, and a routine infant care code. But when we go to ICD-10, we add with and without abnormal findings. We have greater specificity, including trimester in the prenatal care. So that's why I say it's going to be difficult to do OB coding, because whether that patient is in the first, second, or third trimester is built into the code. And if the patient has um, uh, uh, a high-risk pregnancy, then there are so many codes to use, and trimester is built into the code. And you say, well, in OB coding, we don't usually submit a claim. We submit it globally. But sometimes the patient changes insurance from one um, trimester to the next, and we have to submit codes. Or some of our managed Medicaid programs want individual um, diagnosis codes, want one individual claims for the prenatal visits. So prenatal codes get difficult. We have codes for newborns under 8 days and between 8 and 28 days. And then we have one code for most immunizations. So here we have a general adult medical examination with and without abnormal findings. So Z00.00, encounter for a general adult medical examination without abnormal findings. But if there's a breast lump or a, a, it looks like the ovary might have a be bloating or something, then Z00.01, encounter for general medical examination with abnormal findings. We've got that same thing for GYN, a general GYN exam with abnormal findings or without abnormal findings. For the babes, we have a health examination for a newborn up to eight days old. Those must be fun visits to do. Everybody loves a newborn. Um, or Z00.111, health examination for a newborn eight to 28 days old. And then just like we saw for the general adult exam and for the GYN exam, we have encounter for routine child health examination with or without abnormal findings. Just what we needed, right? Um, with a little more complexity about coding for well visits. So we look in the, the, the question that always comes up right after that is, you know, do we have to wait for lab results? Do I have to wait for the pap smear to, for with or without abnormal findings? And at the front of the ICD-10 book, um, it says it's abnormal findings at the time of the visit, and you don't have to wait for labs. It says code first, the examination code, starting with, with the, these nice Z codes that we have, and code second, any abnormal findings. So if you have a patient who you do discover um, a, a cardiac arrhythmia, and they have never had that cardiac arrhythmia before, and you find it at the time of the uh, exam, the preventive exam, you code first the examination with the abnormal findings, and then you code second the um, cardiac arrhythmia. The, the question, let me go back to that. The question then always comes up, what about pre-existing abnormal findings? What about that patient who's got um, non-healing ulcers, and you've treated that patient for their non-healing ulcers forever and ever. Do we count that as an abnormal finding, and should we use the with or without abnormal finding codes? And what I'm going to say about that is that the guidelines aren't specific. Because remember, this is a coding system, not a reimbursement system. And this is one of the things that I think is so frustrating for our clinicians, is when we think about coding, we think about reimbursement, because we're submitting these claims in order to get paid. Whereas the coding system, these ICD-10 codes, really are about reporting um, on the conditions for our patients. So there's nothing in the ICD-10 guidelines that tell us if the patient has diabetes and hypertension, and we're going to submit those on the claim form, should we code with or without abnormal findings? Until we get some payer guidance, I'm going to recommend we code 
without abnormal findings unless it is something that we have discovered, not we, that your clinician has discovered today on physical exam. Um, I would still report the patient's underlying medical conditions just as we do now, but I would use the without abnormal findings unless it is something discovered today on physical exam. And that's just my opinion from reading the um, guidelines at the front. Immunization coding in ICD-10, yay, there's only one code, Z23, encounter for immunization. And it says underneath it to report also in your procedure code. So that is, now in ICD-9, we have repetitive things. We code immunization for uh, hepatitis. And then in our diagnosis code, we code need for immunization for hepatitis. So now we're going to just, just report or bill for the immunization based on the CPT code. And then we're going to have one diagnosis code for the um, uh, encounter. We have some special screenings. These march along pretty nicely. Encounter for screening of malignant neoplasm, uh, long-term use of anticoagulants, uh, breast cancer screening. I, I don't think we're going to have any trouble with those. And then screening for malignant neoplasm of the prostate. Here are some codes that really have a one-to-one -one match between ICD-9 and ICD-10. And we're always so happy when that happens because we know there aren't a lot of them that have this one-to-one -one match if we're going from uh, 10,000, from, excuse me, from 14,000 codes to 70,000 codes. Contraceptive counseling gets a little more detailed. Um, we have an other and general advice on contraceptive counseling, encounter for other general counseling and advice on contraception. There's a few more um, encounters related to IUDs. They match pretty well. And then surveillance for others. We don't have a specific code for implantable subdermal device, but we have for other contraceptives. So there we have our wrap-up for primary care on coding for signs and symptoms. Not going to be any trouble for us. Mental health, we want to get a little more specific about our behavioral health and mental health diagnosis codes, particularly when we're prescribing suboxone and treating opioid dependence and then examinations, where we have this new uh, categorization of with or without abnormal findings. So um, we can open up the uh, for questions. If you have a question, go ahead and type it into the uh, message box, the chat box, for organizers only, and I'd be happy to answer the questions. Holly, are we ready to go? We are. We have a few questions today, um, but definitely if folks still have questions, we do have time to address them, so feel free um, to send some our way. Our first question is, how would you code child abuse that has not been confirmed yet and is only suspected? So I'm going to go back and show that um, slide, if nobody minds me screening back through, because we do have a code for that. So we... Um, have codes for adult and child abuse and neglect, other maltreatment suspected. And we would go to the T76 category. And you'd think I'd have my ICD-10 book out right now. It's so heavy. Um, by the way, when I go places, it's I, I hate bringing it, but it, I have to bring it. So we go to T76, and we have a code for neglect or abandonment suspected, child or adult physical abuse suspected, child or adult, sexual abuse suspected, and it has um, includes rape suspected, sexual abuse ex 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 suspected, child or adult, and psychological abuse. There's one for unspecified, unspecified maltreatment suspected, but let's try not to use that. And these are all four, uh, five character codes such as T76.11. And then at the very start, under T76, it gives us the, the category code. It tells us what it excludes. It says, use an additional injury if applicable to identify any associated current injury. So if the patient did have a physical injury and you suspected it was child abuse, you would, you would code that additionally. And then it says in a, in a little pink box, 
the appropriate seventh character is to be added to each code from category T76, and then it's the initial, subsequent, and sequela. So that's how we would code for that condition. Great. Um, our next question is, if we see a patient for an annual exam and also address hypertension and diabetes, which we would normally add those diagnosis codes on the claim form, should we code with or without abnormal findings for the exam code? So that is, as I said, that's really um, opinion on my part. And I would code without abnormal findings, and then I would code for the diabetes and the hypertension and the chronic kidney disease. But these are examples of things that I would be watching in um, the first, oh, I don't know, starting October 10th through October 30th. I would be watching really closely if I'm getting any denials for those or if my payers are giving me on any more specific advice about those. Because this is new for us and it's new for the payers as well. And they may, uh, they may provide us with some policy guidance as we go along. So I would be setting up an alert and looking at those denials very closely. And not just for this, but for everything in that first couple of weeks in October, um, just as soon as you can expect to get payment for services that you've put in, so certainly by the middle of the month, uh, I would be looking and seeing if I was having any denials. So that's what I would do. Holly? Great. Um, we have two questions, and both are asking you to just confirm some uh, material that you went over. The first is, in terms of mental health, we always told providers not to use the codes in primary care, or at least not in the, in the first position. Can you confirm that that's true? That's, I think, what their understanding was when you went over that section. Yeah, so we never used to like to use those codes. And we would say to each other, oh, don't use depression in the first position, because now the payer is going to deny it, because you're not part of the mental health, behavioral health network. And Medicare used to pay less. Do you remember this? They used to, instead of paying 80% of the allowable, Medicare used to pay 62.5% of the allowable. So, you know, you were really dis had a disincentive to provide mental health treatments for patients. We know we need to do that. But med I don't see the private private payers continuing to deny those. So, if you have a private payer that's doing that, you know, but if that is your only diagnosis, that's the diagnosis we're going to use. Medicare phased out over a period of 5 years or 4 years that differential payment for mental health problems. So now Medicare pays the full 80% of uh, their due, poor, their, their amount due. It used to be that the patient ended up paying more for if you used a psychiatric diagnosis on the claim form. So Medicare doesn't do that anymore. So I would go ahead and I would, what I like it to do is match what's in the record. So if the physician, nurse practitioner, physician assistant writes number one, major depressive disorder recurrent, mild, severe, remember I'm going to use that language now, then I want that to be number one on the claim form. If the, if the clinician writes one, chronic kidney disease, two, uh, you know, uh, the code for being on dialysis, and three, depression, which many patients who are on dialysis are depressed, then I would follow that the physician has put it in. And in that case, I, you know, I, I've talked a lot about specified codes. There's only so much time in a day, and our clinicians are already spending so much of it buried in the EMRs. So I want to prioritize, and I want to use the most specific codes on the codes that the clinician is treating. So if the clinician is treating the first three codes, and then the fourth one is she's continuing to see oncology for her anemia or her whatever type of blood disorder she has. If that fourth one is less specific, I'm not going to worry about that so much. But um, I would go ahead and follow along what the clinician has done. And if, if they've put depression in the first position in their assessment, I want depression in the first position on the claim form. I lost what I was going there a minute, Holly. Did you see that? I think you came back, though. I think you <laughs> Thank you. Um, and our last question, unless there's any last minute questions that anyone wants to send through the chat, um, is another question about con uh, confirmation. And um, 
the clinician wrote, I just want to confirm what you said. Is there only one diagnosis code for immunizations? Yes. I, you know, and for, I, I, I kept looking for more because I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe my eyes that there was only one because I've always been a little bit frustrated about having to look up those other codes, but there is just one code for immunizations. I, you know, it's one of the only things that gets easier between ICD-9 and ICD-10. So we have no additional questions. I just want to thank everybody for joining us today and thank Betsy for being with us again. Our next session is on July 7th, so next Tuesday starting at noon, and that's a little bit different than the sessions we've been running. Uh, the first part will be uh, specifically about coding for OBGYN, and the second part will be for ophthalmology. And anyone who's registered, you'll receive instructions about how to get into that meeting and how that meeting will run when we send that information out. I don't know if you have anything else to add, Betsy. No, thank you very much. I look forward to the week. Great. Thanks, everybody.